I met murder on the way. He had a face like Castlereagh. Now, a great deal of what Henry Kissinger has done to this republic and to its democracy and its constitution and to countless uh, defenseless populations and individuals around the world, a great deal of what he's done has actually been justified in point of saving face. I'm sure you know how the argument goes. If we don't kill all these people, everyone will think we've gone soft. Our face is at stake, our credibility. It's therefore a good thing there is a book here, if someone seems to want me to sign it, and it's got a, thi a thing on it. You, you won't mind if I just, I know you know the face in a way, but just think. Who would you kill to save that face? <laughs> to which massacre would you make yourself an accomplice to prevent that face from creasing with anxiety? <laughs> you laugh. So you should. But if you have tears, uh, prepare to shed them now. Because that was done on a, on a, on a gigantic scale. And in your name and with your money, though, you can... You can a shred of dignity can be saved. It wasn't done with your permission. At least they cared enough about you to lie to you about these things. But when they leaked out, it was usually a face-saving operation. In fact, it was the saving of face that Henry Kissinger himself gave as the justification when he was asked by President de Gaulle why he continued to bomb formerly French Indochina. He said, it's a matter of our face. Have you recently heard the phrase orderly, peaceful, democratic transition of power. <laughs> I'm just trying to brush your patriotic G-spot here. You have heard it, haven't you? You've heard it quite a lot recently. Um, you've been perhaps prompted to think, why do they keep on saying that? Isn't it a bit suspicious that they keep on mentioning that we here have and enjoy an orderly, peaceful, democratic transition of power? If we really had an orderly, peaceful, democratic transition of power, why would there be a need for them to keep on telling us that we have an orderly, peaceful, democratic transition of power? Is there something sinister about the repetition of the phrase, orderly, democratic, peaceful, transition of power? Is there something perhaps a little robotic or uncertain about it? Well, could be. What I want to speak about, and I'll be as terse as I decently can, is exactly that. Because the origins of the career of Henry Kissinger, the moment when he um, morphs, if you like, from being a mediocre, power-worshipping academic um, in, search of a, in search of a powerful patron, morphs from that into one of the most powerful people in American history and on the global stage, and the single greatest unpunished criminal so far unindicted, the moment when that happened was in the closing months of the 1968 presidential election in these United States. Now, we used to speculate that this had happened. And some people guessed that it had happened, hypothesized that it had happened. But I think I can claim from my book that it can now be documented as having happened, that that election was criminally subverted by a group of named individuals around candidate Richard Nixon, who in a very tight election in which the Johnson-Humphrey administration rested its entire claim on the Paris peace negotiations on Vietnam, because along with the rest of the political establishment, including Henry Kissinger, by the way, they had long concluded that the war had to be stopped. With that as the background, as I say, the Nixon gang, as I don't hesitate to call it, evolved a plan, a very simple one. If they were to go covertly to the South Vietnamese military Hunter, and say to them, look, if you will withdraw from these talks, and if you will withdraw just before the elections, and destroy the Paris peace negotiations, and simultaneously the Democrats claim to be running on a peace plan, and should we become the government of the United States, we, the Nixon uh, campaign, you will get a better deal from us. That's the essence of the deal. How can I speak about it without sounding as if I'm advancing a conspiracy theory? Very simply. It's taken a very long time, and a number of us in Washington have been working on it for years, but now we have the FBI transcripts because the Johnson administration, though it didn't share this with you, ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends, brothers and sisters, did know this was good, did get wind of, of this treasonous, illegal, covert diplomacy, and placed bugs in Mr. Nixon's headquarters and on his plane and elsewhere. Legal bugs, by the way, but not bugs they wanted particularly to own up to. 
So we now actually have, and I've, re I've reprinted them for your delectation, we have the conclusive evidence of the evolution of this disgusting plan, which I want to spend a little more time on. It involved, it, there were two prongs to it. The first was Mr. Nixon, um, Spiro Agnew, and John Mitchell uh, contacting the South Vietnamese uh, military dictatorship and dealing with them and their representatives in Washington privately on the deal. The second was to have a spy at the Paris Peace Talks where Averill Harriman was conducting the negotiations, so to speak, openly, legally, constitutionally for the United States. And the person who attached himself to those negotiations and was trusted by many of the Democrats, Harriman, Holbrook, and others whose names will be known to you, was Henry Kissinger, ostensibly there as a friend of Nelson Rockefeller and as a liberal Republican. And now we know that that's how he contributed. He, he was the one who forwarded the news to Nixon of what the United States negotiating position would be at any given moment. So Nixon had perfect knowledge in subverting the Democrats' uh, election campaign of um, all that he needed to know. Now, it's a trivial objection to make, but all of that was highly illegal under the Logan Act, which specifically punishes private secret diplomacy by American politicians that un undercut the negotiating positions of the United States. Every country must have some such law. That's what it's called in this country. And as I say, it took a very long time to, to establish it, but it now can be said to be true. And that's why Richard Nixon, who only met Henry Kissinger twice in those years, once very briefly to shake his hand, and the second to ask him if he'd like to be national security advisor. <laughs> uh, pretty odd for someone who disliked even the presence of Jews in the room. Uh, that's how it was done. And a star was born. But, mark the sequel, the illegal mortgage the covert lease that was taken out by that action on another four years of war, because the South Vietnamese military dictatorship did withdraw from the Paris Peace Talks, very abruptly, on the 3rd of November, just before the vote, perfectly as to time in point of the plan, uh, expected that the deal was supposed to stick. And the Nixon administration behaved thereafter as if it was indeed supposed to stick. And so... In the next uh, four to five years, 22,500 of the names you can find on the wall on the Vietnam Memorial in Washington were lost. And we don't know, and I sometimes think don't, don't really want to know, how many walls we'd have to build to record the names of the Vietnamese civilians who were lost in the same period, whose lives were thrown away, murdered actually, nor to record the fact that the war was extended into two neutral countries, non-combatant countries, Cambodia and Laos, by carpet bombing concealed from Congress um, and directed at civilian populations en masse. No one's ever going to know how many people are buried under that, but we know who ordered and supervised and intimately conducted it at any rate. And all this was done and all those lives were needlessly criminally thrown away in order that the war could finally end with some face for Nixon and some face, do you want another? Can you take another? No, you don't. Oh, you don't. You've gotten the point now. Face, say, on exactly the same terms as had been on offer in Paris in 1968 from the Johnson-Humphrey administration. Now, pause and consider that. Taken together, in other words, the subversion and destruction and derailing of a United States presidential election and the extension of an already criminal war of aggression and atrocity into Indochina and into two new countries, for four, maybe nearly five years, taken together because they are the same action. I think there's, there's no rival yet to my modest claim made in my book that that's the most single wicked act in American history. And you might pause to note another thing. Of the four conspirators, Mr. Nixon, who was nearly impeached, people forget this, but the first article of impeachment against him when the articles were being prepared was for conducting a secret war in Cambodia. Had to cop a plea, as is well remembered, and resign in disgrace. Vice President Agnew, as he became, uh, became the um, first vice president to have to leave in, under similar circumstances and was indicted for other reasons as well. The, fourth con the third of the four conspirators, John Mitchell, became the first United States Attorney General to go to the joint, to the slammer, to jail at last. What got one, just once, just every now and then it does happen. And I have his prison number in my book if you want to look it up. 
Um, and he was, of course, with Henry Kissinger, the uh, main member of the 40 Committee, the committee that oversees all United States covert actions abroad, and though those are illegal at home. Only one of them remains unpunished. His, um, his impunity is beginning to look conspicuous, not to say obscene. So that's where we start with orderly, peaceful, democratic transitions of power. But it's not by any means where we end. I'll give a um, golly from a, a potential salad of examples. One might choose uh, that of Chile. Why do I propose Chile? Well, because the Chilean people were very proud of the fact, and justifiably so, that of all the governments and, and societies in the southern cone of the Americas, Latin America, as it's sometimes called, South America, they were the only ones who had managed to evolve a political system where the armed forces, though they were not considered politically neutral, and did intervene in um, social battles here and there in between elections, very deliberately, very uh, noticeably, very honorably, abstained from picking the government or determining who would win an election or whether an election would be held. Chile had an unbroken record, in other words, of peaceful, democratic, orderly transition of power. And in 1970, it became the turn of the Popular Unity Coalition, led by Dr. Salvador Allende, to win. And though uh, that was against some odds, a vast financing of the other side by the CIA and so on, that was more or less ordinary. That was the kind of thing one had come to allow for. The Chilean uh, parliament was going to ratify him, and the Chilean uh, conservative parties were going to vote to confirm him as president. Chile has a... I think it's a 60-day, but it may, I'm open to correction, it may be a 90-day transition period. First you win the election, then there's a transition after which Congress and the Supreme Court confirm you. Orderly, peaceful, democratic transition of power. However, pressed by various interests of their own, the scope of which I'm not going to bore you with now, Mr. Nixon and Mr. Kissinger decided it wasn't going to be democratic, peaceful, orderly transition of power in Chile. That there should instead be a military coup that would destroy the Allende presidency and the coalition that had elected him. This much is now fairly well known. Principal obstacle to this, the reluctance of the Chilean military to do as was requested of it. Symbolic, emblematic element in that reluctance, the person, the single person of General René Schneider, an honorable conservative, a constitutionally minded officer, the chief of the Chilean general staff. He told all his officers they were to obey their oath to the Constitution and to pay, play no part in any uh, seduction of them from their duty, whoever might offer it. Quite a guy. At a meeting on a certain day in Washington, D.C., of which I have the minutes, Henry Kissinger decided General Schneider had to be murdered because he was that obstacle. Because if he was, if he remained <coughs> chief of the Chilean armed forces, there would be a peaceful, democratic, orderly transition of power in Chile. And we have now what lawyers call, and I can present it, I do have document by document, minute by minute, cable by cable, what lawyers call a lay-down case. Henry Kissinger suborned, formed the plan for, supplied the money for, and the armament for, and the cover-up for, and the payoff for a murder in a country that was a democracy with which the United States was not at war and had always enjoyed excellent trade and diplomatic relations. To read what I present, I perhaps shouldn't advertise it too melodramatically myself. You might want to be the judges of it, but I'll just say what it was like to read it for me when I went through it. It's like reading the John Gotti tapes. Not just the tones of voice and the thuggishness, the vulgarity, the greed, and the certainty that everyone can be bought. Not just that, but the way in which a wet job, a hit, is actually planned and executed. For example, you, want, you might ask yourself, I was challenged on this by some um, right-wing cretin the other day in a television series. <laughs> he said the Chilean fascists, uh, he didn't deny the Chilean fa there, was a, there was a Chilean fascist organization with a proven record of violence that had actually tried to overthrow the Christian Democratic government in Chile from the right a few years before. Um, so there were identifiable men of fanatical violent tendencies, proven records of violence, who had been found by Kissinger for the operation and given the guns. This man wanted to know, well, they had guns already. Why did the U.S. Embassy want to give them guns? I said, it wasn't the embassy. They were sent from Washington, 
all the way in the diplomatic bag with special serial numbers to be given to these people. Well, ask yourself the question. This is where the criminal mentality it becomes so evident. Of course they had guns of their own. They, they, they were nothing but gun nuts and, and, as I say, political fascists. What they wanted was the proof that the United States government was really on their side. That's what they had to be given. That's why the guns had to be sent through the diplomatic bag, to impress them so they could impress others. You might not believe this, but our plan has Washington's support, and so it did. And it took three tries to kill General Schneider, um, and every time there was a failure, there were urgent cables from Washington, what are you doing, why have you failed? I have them all. Try again, try harder. The money was then paid to the gang, and the arrangement was made to conceal the complicity from investigators in uh, Santiago and also in Washington, D.C., to this day, but not for much longer. Um, and I will just tell you something that might make you have a little holiday in some of your hearts, as it does in some of mine, so in, in mine, some of the time, or some of my heart, if you like. <laughs> the, the bit that hasn't been shriveled by exposure to this. Uh, I must pick my words with care. Now that all this evidence is in, there is nothing to stop the relatives of people murdered in Chile from bringing a suit under the Alien Tort Claims Act in the United States against named identifiable American officials and accusing them, it's a civil suit, but accusing them of murder, kidnap, torture, and disappearance. And I know that there is such a group of Chileans and that they are going to bring such a suit and Henry Kissinger's name is going to be on it. And you applaud, and so you should, and it shows your generosity um, and your, well, your decency, your solidarity. But why are you applauding? Is it not an absolutely shattering disgrace that that task of bringing that case should be left to victims and volunteers in another country? Isn't that a shame? Isn't that an absolute scandal? Where, is there not one district attorney in these United States or one congressional committee that will not say that with this evidence before it, it should proceed, it should adopt this task? Are we really to say to people who've lost their sons and brothers and fathers and husbands to torture and murder and disappearance that they must scrape together the funds and bring themselves as petitioners to a court in the United States and only then have a word of justice spoken to them? What an appalling state of affairs that would be and is. But that's what they ask you to live with now. And that's in the face of all the evidence because there is no, there's no defense that can be pleaded to this. It's a, it is, as I say, a prima facie laid down case. Well, that's the situation now. And that's the situation also as the United States remains the chief moral tutor and chief lecturer on human rights and war crimes to every other society in the world, the one that requires the speedy bringing to justice of war criminals and wanted violators of international law that threatens with guns and with money those, who don't, those societies that do not speedily examine themselves and conduct, uh, quite properly, by the way, in my view, uh, uh, purges and inquiries and trials of their own. But how much longer do you think this ridiculous, this ridiculous dichotomy, this morally shameful and, and legally impossible dichotomy can be allowed to persist. Well, we don't know how long, but in that interregnum, the case of Henry Kissinger becomes the salient one, the test case. And so it will be a, it will be a case of everything that's described as American values. Now, I don't know if I might, I might make the assumption that I already made my point. Could I make that assumption? Because I'm, I'm quite happy to assume that people who come to meetings of this kind in, in, in bookstores of this sort have come to talk as well as to listen. I hope I'm not wrong about that. And my usual principle is that I won't leave if there's an unanswered question. But I think perhaps I might give you one more, <laughs> just one more transition before we, um, I'll tell you why I, I, I like it, or I don't like it, why it's sort of, I want to insist upon it because it does involve me reading a bit from my own stuff but then you expected that. Um, because it's been so much forgotten. And that's the mass murder in, in Bangladesh in um, the early 1970s. I remember it. I'm sure some of you remember it too. It's slightly slipped out of history now. In 1971, 
um, when Kissinger was still, had been National Security Advisor only for two years. A, a crisis arose in Pakistan, a major US, US military ally in, in Asia, which uh, then consisted of two chunks of territory. One, what we call Pakistan, still with its capital, Islamabad, but its main city, Karachi. And the other, what's now called Bangladesh, but was then called East Pakistan, West Bengal. Um, it had been obvious ever since the partition of India that the Bengali wing, of, as Salman Rushdie describes it, as a, a, a country with two wings, an east wing and a west wing. The people in the east wing wanted to get out. They would, they would want to devote themselves into an independent state. And having not had any elections for a long time, General Yahya Khan was pressed by all kinds of people to have one, hold one. And there was even talk of a peaceful, democratic, orderly transition of power in Pakistan, which hadn't had been any talk of that for a very long time. But it was known to all that uh, if there was such an election, that the Bangladeshi, the Bengali Nationalist Party, led by Sheikh Rahman, would win it, at least in the East, would win it overwhelmingly, perhaps conclusively. So it was argued in the State Department and uh, to Henry Kissinger and others that, um, that the United States should remind General Yai Khan that he better respect the results of the election, because it looked as if he might not. But no message of that kind was ever sent. None whatever. So when they did, the Bengalis, win the elections, first General Yai Khan cancelled the elections, then he dissolved the parliament, then he arrested all the people who'd won the elections. And not content with that, he unleashed the Pakistani army in Bengal in an operation that was described at any rate by the American accredited diplomats on the spot as genocidal. It certainly had every appearance of a genocide. In other words, it had been long concerted. And though it was very indiscriminate in point of the mass of the people, we think we are, not, again, not certain, and it may be indecent to speculate, but probably not less than three million Bengalis were killed in this bloodbath. But it was also, as other genocides are, rather specific and intimate. In other words, in the first day or so, the army rounded up and killed all the intellectuals, all the journalists, all the lawyers, all the academics, um, all the uh, journalists and broadcasters in, in the capital city, to try, so to speak, to decapitate a Bengali nationalism. And the best remembered symbol of this was the uh, laying of an ambush, the setting of a, up of a machine gun barrage uh, outside the women's dormitory in the university. Um, then a fire set at the back of the dormitory and the women students machine gunned as they, as they ran out. This was repeated across the city. So two telegrams were sent at that point, one from Pakistan to Washington and one from Washington to Pakistan. I'd like to read you the first one, which came from um, the consul, the, em the ambassador, in fact, in Bangladesh. His name was Archer Blood. He should be remembered not just for his name, but as a good man with a good staff, and it was signed by almost every single person in the U.S. Embassy in Dhaka, and it was sent on the 6th of April, 1971, back to Washington, and it said the following, our government has failed to denounce the suppression of democracy, our government has failed to denounce atrocities, our government has failed to take forceful measures to protect its citizens, while at the same time bending over backwards to placate the West Pakistan-dominated government. Our government has evidenced what many will consider moral bankruptcy, ironically at a time when the USSR has sent President Yahya Khan a message defending democracy, condemning the arrest of a leader of a democratically elected majority party, incidentally a pro-Western one, I'm still quoting, and calling for an end to repressive measures and bloodshed. In this, in this conflict, in which I'm italicizing this as they did, in which unfortunately the overworked term genocide is applicable when that uh, 20 uh, signature message from the U.S. Uh, diplomatic office in Dhaka arrived in Washington, it was signed by a further nine of the senior officers for Asia in the State Department. And that it remained for some time the most uh, widely publicized and the one most widely signed and promulgated by professional civil servants in Washington in protest of a policy until the mass resignations from kissing his staff over the invasion of Cambodia, another record he was later to set and break. So that was the telegram that Washington got. The telegram that Washington sent was signed by Henry Kissinger and sent to General Yahya Khan and said, we thank you for the delicacy and tact with which you have handled this very difficult situation. 
that was the three million dead, five million refugee, mass destruction of the intellectual and cultural life of Bangladesh, resolution, in Kissinger's terms, of the peaceful democratic orderly transition in Pakistan and Bengal. And I could go on. The East Timorese people are only this year beginning to recover enough feeling in their limbs to have the election that was promised them under international law in 1975 when they should have become independent as a Portuguese colony but were instead handed over by Henry Kissinger to the genocidal rapacity of an Indonesian government that has since thought better of it and has renounced even its own claim to East Timor. That episode that you just heard about from Bangladesh is known to the New York Times editorial board as the opening to China, Henry Kissinger's proudest monument. Because what wasn't known at the time or understood was that General Yahya Khan was the intermediary for American diplomacy in arranging a photo op for Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon in Beijing where they could pose with Joan Lai and Mao Zedong. It's never been explained to me, or I think to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, why it is that U.S. diplomacy had to be conducted as a covert action. After all, many of us had for a long time been saying it was rather absurd for the United States to pretend that the People's Republic of China did not exist. That door was nailed shut by Henry Kissinger and Richard. Any one of us who said, shouldn't we consider having diplomatic relations with Beijing? Looks like the capital of quite a large country. They appear to have had a rather large revolution. There seems to be a lot of people living there. We're in no contact with. No, what, what are you, some kind of a communist or a faggot? What is this? No, no, we'll do the door opening, thanks very much. To rescue what? To rescue our faces from the shame we've inflicted on the country in, in Vietnam to try and drive a wedge between China and Russia, to try and be clever that way, and to try and get a photo op and get on the nightly news. But we could only do it through the intercession of a dictator. We couldn't ask Congress to help. We couldn't ask the diplomatic service to help. We couldn't tell the State Department about it. It's a hasty thing. It's a racketeering covert operation. It's the opening to China. You notice the opening to China still hasn't taken place? There is no transparency in U.S.-China relations. Nothing of the sort. Uh, have you ever been asked... Hey, about that opening to China, I'd say worth the lives of three million Bengalis, wouldn't you? On any day. No, of course you've never been asked that. That's what it did take. That's what they thought it was worth. That's what they think of you, that you might swallow such a thing. But think of the sycophancy of the press in the way that it always talks about this. My profession has made this man, this assassin, this common murderer, this accomplice in mass murder, and genocide, this accomplice in the breaking of American law, in the violation of the American Constitution, in the subversion of an American election, in the killing of many, many people much better than himself, to please a boss, Richard Nixon, the thought of whom in power now makes everybody gag, would make a maggot gag when you think about it. There's my prose going again. <laughs> This man is the independent, detached, neutral commentator on events on ABC News. Nightline. He's the syndicated columnist for the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post. He's the honored guest at Tina Brown and Harry Evans and Mortimer Zuckerman's dinner parties and cocktails in New York. So it's a huge indictment of a, of a, of a craft, a trade. I won't, call, I won't call journalism a profession quite yet but of a calling that is, of which I'm, I haven't completely despaired. A very big indictment of that and of the role it plays in our culture. And I have much more to say about that if asked. And it's also tremendous, if I say this for myself, what I, what the implication of what I say at any rate is a, a, an enormous reproach to that fantastically overfed and complacent group, the American human rights community which is now almost a state within the state. In Washington, I think I could probably go every night of the week if I cared to and eat for free at a dinner where one human rights group gives an award to another <laughs> for its own bravery and courage. In New York, you could do it at lunchtime too, most days. <laughs> human rights prizes for journalists, human rights prizes for retired diplomats, human rights prizes for other human rights groups, human rights round robins, full-page advertisements in the New York Times, all of them tending to the view that the United States really must do more about the situation in Sri Lanka, or, um, which, by the way, it ought to, or practically anywhere else you can name except the west bank of the Jordan River. And I'm in enough trouble for now. To, I'm not going to get into that right away. <laughs> um, but there in the middle of Manhattan, where they meet for these dinners and give themselves the prizes and the awards, is the man 
that I hope I've persuaded you they might be taking, uh, or should by now have taken, another look at. And it will be to really, really terribly to our shame if the task of bringing him to justice, him to justice, and doing justice for the victims is left to the victims themselves. We must swear we can and will do better than that. Thank you. Thanks very much. The lady asks, she remembers a lot of this too, did she miss anything or did nobody in 71 or so um, make any of these kinds of point? The answer is, and I, I don't want to seem as if it all depends on me because it does not. As I say in my book, I'm standing on the shoulders of a lot of people who tried to investigate it. Um, that a, a good deal of work was done by the church committee, for example, a good deal of work was done by Seymour Hirsch and some other reporters in Washington, especially on Chile, but that the extent and depth of it wasn't known until very recently. In fact, it's, I mean, I've been doing this for years in Washington, for 20 years now. It's only when Congressman Hinchy, last year in an amendment for Congress, insisted as a rider to the bill of appropriations that the CIA disgorge everything it had on Chile. It, this is in response by the way, to the arrest of, of Pinochet and the implications of that, which are the things that are worrying Kissinger now. And that amendment passed, and to everyone's surprise, the CIA just complied. They gave us all the stuff. And I didn't know, I was sure, but I didn't know until then, that you, we would find that they had paid off the people who killed Schneider. We even have the amount of dollars they gave them, and when and where. And, and the point of, in, the, in, the, in the ocean off Valparaiso where they threw the guns to conceal the evidence. We know it all now. That's why people, the, the relatives can sue if they want to. Because you can't just sue on, in general, any more than the British special branch could be told to go around. This is an, an event I'd really love to have seen, I must say. They weren't, to, they weren't told, um, go around to the clinic in London and arrest the Chilean junta. They were told, go around, you've got a warrant, go around to Mr. Pinochet's place and tell him he's nicked. Are you Augusto Pinochet? See, <laughs> well, I have here a warrant for your arrest. You may, you may remain silent, but everything you say can be taken down and bloody well used in evidence against you. I would love to have seen that. And then two months of house arrest where he's only allowed to see Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> which might not be cruel, but certainly feel unusual. <laughs> Better still, because I was terrified when the British let him go on humanitarian grounds, because I know that the humanitarian grounds are the last thing that weigh with them. But better, he's in, on trial in Chile now. That's much better. So I'm asked to comment on the following uh, objection, really. Is there not a danger in um, focusing on Henry Kissinger in ignoring the fact that he's the one of many executives of a policy of imperialism? You wouldn't find in me a very strong opponent of that view. But I would stipulate that, uh, for example, when it came a time to pay off the mortgage of the Vietnam uh, secret deal that I talked about at the beginning, not many people in the Nixon administration were privy to that deal. Okay? And one of the things that was necessary for them to redeem it with the South Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese partners was to pretend, what everyone in the political establishment had long since ceased to pretend, that the uh, National Liberation Front of South Vietnam was not an indigenous force, right? that it was somehow Vietnamese infiltrating Vietnam from some other moment, which was thought by most, most of the policy establishment to be a fantasy by then, and was. But the fantasy had consequences. It meant, ah, but we could dry up this infiltration if we invaded Cambodia and Laos and bombed it flat, and then these other Viet would be less trouble. Well... It has to be said for their, to their credit that Melvin Laird, the Secretary of Defense, and William Rogers, the Secretary of State, said, that's ridiculous. We're not going to invade Cambodia. Anyway, it's a violation of international law. There was a big argument within the administration about whether to do it. Bebe Rebozo, Nixon's mafia chum, got on the phone. We have the records of that thanks to Kissinger because he was so suspicious. He's helped us a lot. He, never, he, he had himself bugged to make sure he had the record. Nixon and Rebozo, on the eve of the invasion, ring Kissinger drunk, blind drunk, and slur into the phone and say, 
we're going to go ahead, never mind state, never mind defense, but if it fails, Henry, they slurred into the phone. If it fails, it's your ass. That's why, that's why Kissinger kept tapes, because that's the sort of people he was working for. Did he go with Rogers and Laird and say, maybe we shouldn't do this? No, he went with Nixon and Raposo. He made the difference. Voila. Take another case. Where, where he's in the room with the Indonesian general staff on the day that the invasion of East Timor is not planned, because it's been planned for a long time. The forces are already there. It takes a long time to get them into readiness, and of course the U.S. knows that they're ready to go. It's, it, he's there on the day the go-ahead is given. He gives the go-ahead, as we now know. However, on the uh, plane on the way back, while he's still in the air, the State Department receives the news of the information. Now, it's difficult for State. Why? East Timor is under a UN mandate, a, pr a responsibility of Portugal, a NATO ally, which is decolonizing. Its, it, its job is to give the East Timorese an election and an independence constitution and get out and go home. That's the situation there. For Indonesia to cross the border is a violation of international law, gross violation of international law, and, it, and an attack on a NATO member. It's not, nothing for the State Department. Second, it's a gross violation of American law. The Foreign Assistance Act says you can't use American weapons for operations like that. They're, they're supplied to you only for external defense. Therefore, the State Department issues a statement saying the Indonesians have broken international law and American law. They're probably going to have to have their funding cut off for this by Congress. Kissinger arrives in Washington in a towering rage. How dare you guys undercut me like that? I now have, and it's in the book, I have the whole, the whole transcript of the incredibly tough meeting he had when he got back, shouting at them for betraying him, knifing him in the back. Not without interest, by any means. In which, by the way, he makes a very interesting um, accidental admission, I think. <clears throat> Namely, they say, well, look, uh, Mr. Secretary, it isn't, what they've done is illegal. They have broken the law, and so have we if we support them. And Kissinger says, I know about the law. I know we've broken it, and you've all known for a long time I've wanted the Indonesians to do this. That's an admission well worth having because he's lied about it so often in public. Second, he says, listen, I don't get a, I don't get a commission on these arms sales. <laughs> I don't get a rake-off. Now, it's assumed usually at State Department meetings that the Secretary of State has to make no such disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> It's what you might call a matter of etiquette. You know. <laughs> Probably wrongly, it is assumed the Secretary of State doesn't have a direct interest in arms sales, especially in ones which he's already admitted are illegal and he's going to have to circumvent Congress to keep going, which he did because he did make sure throughout that the Indonesians never ran out of the weapons with which to conduct the massacre. And, and I, I, I add that um, Adam Malik, the Indonesian foreign minister, admitted after two months of, of the operation, in the first two months, he thought the, his, his own forces had killed 200,000 East Timorese civilians, and he was not underestimating it. So there's no excuse here of not knowing, nor of not having foreknowledge, which, by the way, instantly triggers the genocide convention, since we're talking about law. That's, a, that's an obligation on all states. So it's very grave. But just concentrate on the, the rake-off and the commission. Did he, in fact, get offered a rake-off and a commission in that meeting? I now think it's not at all unlikely, because as soon as he ceased to be Secretary of State, he went into business with the Indonesians, and they gave him half of a gold mine, Freeport McMoran gold mine, half share in one, in another disputed island that they don't really legally control, West Syrian, Jaya. And he's been the consultant and middleman for an enormous number of uh, crony capitalist corporations in Jakarta. He's recently hired to Kissinger Associates Mac McClarty, Bill Clinton's former chief of staff. And I would imagine that that's not just bipartisanship, though it is that, mm -hmm. and a perfect idea of what the Clinton world is like, but because most of Mr. Clinton's campaign was floated on the money from the Lippo Group and Mr. Riyadi, and I imagine that Mr. In fact, I know that Mr. McClarty was the middleman for all that. So this is the banana republic you live in now, by the way, in case you're in any doubt. That's how it's done. That's the insult they inflict on you. That's a very sneaky question. I was asked who I thought might represent... Mr. Kissinger, in a civil or other action? Well, it would depend which form it took. I mean, if it was a civil suit, he has a, a partner, also named William Rogers, oddly enough, who was one of his assistant secretaries of state for South America, in fact, uh, who is a partner in Arnold and Porter, which is one of the bigger and nastier Washington law firms. I would imagine that's the way they would go. If the, it's not impossible, there are, there are some magistrates in Chile who've talked about asking to subpoena or even extradite Kissinger if, as the trial of Pinochet goes on. 
Um, and if an extradition order, I think, I'm not sure if the Chileans have the nerve for this, and I would sympathize with them if they didn't, but it would still and all be great if they did. That would put the U.S. government in a very awkward position indeed, um, because the U.S. government generally says it won't have its former officials extradited. All the findings are now in on the blowback from Chile. In other words, the bomb that went off in Washington, D.C., at Sheridan Circle in October 76, a few hundred yards from where I live, that killed the great Orlando Letelier, former Chilean foreign minister, leading Chilean dissident, and his American friend, and then at that point, that moment, driver, Ronnie Moffat. Now, it is still unlawful to set off car bombs in Washington, D.C. during rush hour traffic. There's no, there isn't any immunity to that. And you may have heard quite a lot of noise made about international and state-supported terrorism by the government in your time. Well, now, it took, again, a very, very long time. But now there's another lay-down case that goes the other way. The author of that bomb was Augusto Pinochet, and the criminal division of the Justice Department now knows enough to know that that's true. So if the criminal division of the Justice Department does not issue a writ, an indictment for Pinochet, it will be flagrantly, obviously, delinquent in its job. It won't just be a matter of a double standard. It's, this, it's something for which the Attorney General could and should be impeached, in my view, if it's not done. The question will then arise, how did it take so long to find all this out? Well, because there was a great deal of obstruction of justice, is why, and concealment of evidence. And these also are still crimes. And there are people in Washington who committed them. And you can have as many guesses as you like as to who one of them was. So if that was to be the case, then I don't know who would want to volunteer to defend um, uh, Henry Kissinger. I should think Alan Dershowitz would probably still be available. <laughs> The questioner asked me to speculate on what other avenues of prosecution uh, might lie open, whether um, a federal uh, prosecution or a congressional one or something in The Hague. To answer that in reverse order, the, the International Court of Justice at The Hague, <coughs> which the United States is just a signatory to, though it has great reluctance for reasons that I think will be obvious to people to adhere fully, um, is quite properly not retrospective, or I, I think I mean retroactive. In other words, the Hague Court can't sit on any matter that occurred before it was set up. So we can't get Kissinger there. But it does condition the international atmosphere, because what happened when the British House of Lords um, confirmed the verdict against Pinochet was this. They struck down the defense of sovereign immunity. And they established the idea of universal jurisdiction. In other words, any court is supposed now to, on its own initiative, without waiting for any further instructions, to arrest and either extradite or try offenders against the law on war crimes and crimes against humanity. It's, it's the same law as applies to if you have a pirate in your jurisdiction. And any of them could and even might. Um, and that if you are hailed before such a court, you won't be able to say, well, I admit I did all that, but I was trying to please Richard Nixon at the time. Okay, that won't be good enough as a defense. I have a section in my book drawn largely from General Telford Taylor, who was the senior uh, United States military prosecutor at Nuremberg, who um, wrote a book called Nuremberg and Vietnam, measuring the extent to which the United States had endangered its, its leading politicians by conducting the war in that way. And he wrote the book, by the way, before the invasion or bombing of Cambodia was known. <laughs> and he said that, yes, they had transgressed the Nuremberg standard and that this was no small thing, because as well as conducting the trials largely with its own judges, the United States had enshrined, caused to be enshrined, the Nuremberg Principles in the founding documents of the United Nations, of which the U.S. is the, you might say, the founding member, certainly the host and senior member to this day, and had stated publicly that it, the United States, would consider itself bound by the same standards it had applied at Nuremberg. The difficulty there would be that it, at Nuremberg, for a rather sinister or shady reason, aerial bombardment of civilians is somewhat <laughs> sketchily defined as a war crime. Doing it, do, doing it in itself is not a war crime. I mean, the, the Anglo-American side had more, what would be the word, perhaps embarrassment than, than to say that. Um, but there are ways in which it can be a found criminal, a judge criminal. Um, and then, of course, there is the Genocide Convention, which mandates that states intervene to prevent and to punish uh, genocide as soon as they become aware of it. 
it's in the atmosphere, in other words. Things, a great change was made with the arrest of Pinochet. Jorge Castaneda, for example, the new Mexican foreign minister, recently decided Mexico having arrested, on a warrant from Spain, an Argentine death squad leader who'd been wanted for some time. Normally, Mexico would have sent him back to Argentina, where he could probably have expected to vanish. But the request was to extradite him to Spain to stand trial there, from the same magistrates, by the way, as, as we're after. And it has to be confirmed by the Mexican courts and by the Mexican foreign ministry, but now has been. They are going to send him back to Spain. So the, the, the development in international law is quite uneven and somewhat ragged, but it's all in one direction at the moment. It's evolving towards universal jurisdiction and towards the abolition of sovereign immunity as a defense. So that's why the tape that I have of Kissinger with his publisher very nervous about whether he's going to have to rewrite the Chile stuff and worried about the Chile precedent is encouraging. He was quicker to see it than the human rights community was. I'm asked whether the political class, the criminal class in Washington, D.C., has any real conviction of its own rectitude or, or, or any ideological motivation or whether it just is what it sometimes looks like. There are ideological types in Washington, D.C., no question about it. But if there had been a trial, if the impeachment of Nixon for, for Cambodia had gone ahead in the, in the Congress, which I really wish that it had, because we would be living in a very different world if it had been allowed to do so, um, Nixon would not have stood alone in the dock on that. He, Kissinger would have had to stand there with him. And if the whole gang was arraigned and you had a sort of Nuremberg lineup, I would say that Henry Kissinger would not be the the, uh, the Goebbels of the thing, or the, um, or the Himmler, or the Heydrich, but the Albert Speer. In other words, someone who would have done this for any regime. The reason I think so is particularly because he, he was quite conspicuous in the policy establishment in, by the, the spring of summer of 68 in thinking the Vietnam War was probably, at, at the very best, a bad mistake and should be wound up as quickly as possible. And his findings on this written for Foreign Policy magazine, actually appeared rather irritatingly because they'd, been, they'd gone to press long before. They appeared just as he became National Security Advisor for Nixon. And though I sometimes have debates when I can get them to come out to play, which is not often, with his defenders, they tend to take the line, well, it was a tough time, the world is a dangerous place, I know that, thanks. If nothing done against communism is immoral, and you see the case could be made with the Stalinism, and that's so, then quite a lot of things are potentially entailed in it. I mean, for one, the United States fought on the wrong side in the Second World War, a view that is held by some Republicans, <laughs> but, but covertly. And the other would be that you would need someone who had a strong anti-Stalinist fervor to conduct the policy. Well, Henry Kissinger, as I've just pointed out to you, thought three million Bengalis was a small price to pay for picture of him making nice with Mao Zedong. He was Leonid Brezhnev's best friend. He was the man who told Gerald Ford, uh, his second president, um, don't have Alexander Solzhenitsyn for a, a tea at the Oval Office. Don't have him to the White House. It would upset our Russian friends. Um, and he was the man who most recently, and for quite a large sum of money, defended the right of the Chinese Stalinists to massacre peacefully assembled students in the main square of their own city. So I'll tell you what, I won't take it from him that he's really an anti-Stalinist. I won't take anything from him, as you may have suspected, but I won't, take, I won't have it from him that he's an unsleeping foe of the, of the communist tyranny. It's not true. It's another part of the gigantic lie, or series of gigantic lies, that make up the, the total lie of his reputation and his standing in this country. The Reagan administration, oddly enough, wasn't very keen on Henry Kissinger. Didn't make much use of him. This, this administration has some of, his, some of his clients or types in its ranks. Paul Wolfowitz, I suppose, most notably. And others of his vintage, like Cheney and Rumsfeld. I did not think that George Bush had, had been um, involved personally. I think it was a plan evolved by William Casey. I don't know, I can't say with certainty that the plan was fully carried out, but it was designed and it was tried, and it, it may well have been carried out. It hasn't been proved. Um, for that reason, there won't be a prosecution. I always thought one day somebody's memoirs will come out, because it always happens. Someone does publish some memoirs, and you find out that it's worse than you ever suspected. I know of no exception to this rule so far. 
But uh, as you say, would be, I would, I would prefer, I'm, I'm very glad that John Ashcroft is the Attorney General now because his criminal division has to make up its mind, are we going to indict Pinochet or not? Now, if Janet Reno had done it, which she most certainly didn't and should, and should have done before she left office, she did not, there would have been many people to say, well, it's partisan in any way she's doing it, you know, on the way out of office and so forth. Now it's squarely where we can see it. And the question will arise. Well, it, does the United States agree that there are universal standards in these matters or not? If it doesn't, I'm not the loser, except that we all are. We just simply point out the fact that, that we, the, the contradiction is far too gross to be lived with. The United States cannot simultaneously be the moral tutor and inquisitor and policeman of, uh, of the world on human rights matters and say that these rules don't apply to Americans. In fact, they don't have a language in which they can actually say that. So this is, this is a very exciting moment because all of the, the law that they claim to uphold is evolving against them. And Kissinger is the test case. I'm asked about the role of Nixon and Kissinger in the Christmas bombing. It was their idea. I think it was particularly Nixon's idea and Kissinger's wish to gratify his whim. What Nixon wanted, he generally got from Kissinger. There were times when Kissinger was scared. Of, of Nixon taking bombing decisions when he was drunk, for example. <laughs> Everyone was scared about that. As we now know, James Schlesinger, the then Secretary of Defense, has said that he uh, said on the record that he gave an order, which was actually greatly illegal for him to give and a gross violation of the Constitution. He told the Joint Chiefs, you're not to obey a presidential order unless it's countersigned by the the Defense Department and the National Security Council. They were, they were that scared that Nixon would either launch a nuclear strike or, or try and go for a military coup. And that's been confirmed, and it's confirmed with other, other witnesses to it in my book. I mean, I'm glad the Schlesinger broke the law in that way, I think. That's what it took to try. That's what the atmos moral atmosphere of the Nixon administration was like. Kissinger's comment on the Christmas bombing was that we bombed the North Vietnamese into accepting their offer of concessions. That's his idea of a joke, too. In other words, they, the North Vietnamese had offered a, a bargain. The South Vietnamese, who were still acting in the spirit of the secret bargain they thought they had, had said, if you accept this, you'd be you know, giving in to communism. So while preparing to accept it, Nixon and Kissinger bombed Hanoi anyway to convince the South Vietnamese they weren't going soft. That's what they were committed to by the original sin, if you see what I mean. And that's why he, he actually openly said in front of the cameras, we're bombing North Vietnam into accepting our version of their concept, if you see what I mean. It's an extraordinary thing. Never, never to be forgotten.